Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for our Caltech Astronomy Stargazing Lecture. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels, and I'll be your host for this evening. So thank you for, for, for joining us. Um, so just a layout of our rough schedule of events for tonight. After a few brief announcements, I'll introduce our speaker, who's going to talk for about 30 minutes about galaxy clusters, some of the largest structures in the universe. And following that, we'll have a brief Q&A of five or 10 minutes of questions directly for our speaker, Emily. And then uh, there will be a, a kind of a break. And you have choose your own adventure at this point. Um, we'll set up a Q&A panel in here consisting, consisting of Emily, myself, and two other members of the department who work on other different topics. Um, and then at the same time as that, we've got telescopes being set up as we speak for the good weather that's outside and you're free to go out. We have astronomers who are operating those telescopes to show you various different things in the night sky. And you know, you're free to, to go back and forth and back and forth as you so desire. So in case you, know, you saw all there was to see in the sky, uh, you can come back in and ask some questions or, or vice versa. Um, these events take place once a month on Friday nights, uh, going back seven years now, which is pretty crazy, it makes me feel old. Uh, but all of these have been recorded and are on our YouTube channel. So if you see what you're, you're see um, something you like tonight, feel free. We have over a hundred different lectures on our YouTube channel from various different scientists, preeminent scholars, and so on, talking about different areas of science. In fact, right now we're live streaming to YouTube right now. Hello, YouTube audience. And uh, what what else did I want to say? Um, we have a sister series of events called Astronomy on Tap that take place one Monday night a month. The next one will be November, Monday, November, no, not November, Monday, September 11th. Um, they take place at the Doghouse Beer Garden in Old Town, Pasadena. And because they're less formal, they're in a restaurant bar. It's all ages, but, um, but obviously underage people aren't allowed to drink alcohol, but above the age can drink alcohol. Um, we have two short 15 minute presentations given by local scientists talking about their, their research, but at a public level, we have astronomy themed pub trivia, we have live music, and we have uh, telescopes there for that. So those are super fun. Um, our next one will be about, I just posted the poster, it's in the hallway and it's online as well. It will be about supermassive black holes and how they shape the galaxies around them because they tend to be uh, located in the centers of galaxies, as well as one that's all about stars, star formation, why we even have stars in the universe, what the physics is that dictates their collapse and then their continued, uh, continued life through, for, for billions of years in some cases. So what other announcements are? In addition, we have a rather unique event that's happening in two weeks, two weeks from tomorrow. We're assisting at the Sequoia National Park Dark Sky Festival that will be taking place um, at several different locations around Sequoia National Park, about a four or five hour drive from here, depending on how quickly you, you drive. Uh, but the main base will be around the Lodgepole campground area, and there will be five, maybe six of us that are coming up to give presentations, like 30 minute presentations, much like the one that Emily is going to give in a few moments, um, on topics from exoplanets to uh, what, what like the, the weather is like on different planets in our own solar system, how galaxies in the early universe were observed using James Webb Space Telescope and what that tells us about kind of baby and infant galaxies. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of different topics, but it's not just talks. One of the main reasons you might go to Sequoia National Park is for the wonderful dark skies that are present there. And there will be a number of of telescopes, I think 20 or 25 different telescopes set up at various different locations that you can you can observe on and we'll be assisting with that as well. And obviously, I mean, our observing is pretty good here, but it's much better in Sequoia National Park, uh, far from the city lights. So if you're interested, that's all free and you should, you should uh, I can provide a link on our website, but just look up Sequoia Dark Sky Festival. So that's in two weeks. And I think, oh, one more announcement. Um, in a month's time, we will have a special presentation being given by Jorge Cham, who is a, a famous author and, and comic artist. He, he's responsible for the popular comic called PhD, PhD Comics. 
um, that, uh, that has had a lot of notoriety over the last decade or so. He's going to be giving a presentation here on, I think it's September 25th, all about a new book that's coming out. Um, it's primarily um, focused for audiences in elementary and middle school. Um, but everyone is welcome to join and that'll be a free event. So I'll, I'll post more stuff on our social media and our website when that's, when that's going to happen. So um, enough of me blathering. Uh, our speaker tonight is uh, originally did her, her undergraduate studies in Iowa, University of Iowa, and has joined the department just a few years ago. She's a PhD candidate, a third year P a graduate student here, one of the up and coming uh, scientists in the department. And her research primarily focuses on clusters of galaxies, these largest structures in the universe, largest gravitationally bound structures in the universe. And she's gonna talk a little bit about that tonight. So please welcome Emily Silich. Hi, great. Thanks, Cameron, for the introduction. Um, so as Cameron mentioned, I'm going to be talking about collisions between massive clusters of galaxies, which as advertised are indeed the most energetic events in the universe since the Big Bang itself. Um, but before I dive into these massive collisions, um, I think we should first build up an understanding of what a galaxy cluster is. Um, and in order to contextualize a galaxy cl cluster, uh, we first have to understand the entire history of the universe. Right, so <laughs> it's, it's not that complicated. Um, our current cosmological model, which is the model that we've developed to describe our understanding of the origin and evolution of the universe, says that structures in the universe have formed from smallest to largest. And so what that means is if the universe began at t equals zero, the Big Bang, when the universe itself was created, the smallest structures began to form first. So you can see that about a hundredth of a millisecond after the Big Bang, the very first protons and neutrons started forming. And then about a hundred seconds later, we had the first nuclei. And then it took another 300,000 years for the first neutral atoms to form in the universe. And then as those neutral atoms started to cluster together to find one another, um, they formed the first stars about 300 million years after the universe started. And so those stars then began to age, began to evolve, they began to cluster together to join up with lots of gas. And by a billion years after the Big Bang, the very first population of galaxies began to form. And then it's 13 billion years of galaxy evolution, of galaxies getting closer to one another, clumping up on large scales, um, to the current day when we have clusters of galaxies forming. And so these are the clusters of galaxies that I'm going to be talking about. They are what we call the current stage of cosmological structure formation. They're the biggest things in the universe that are forming right now. And even though we call them clusters of galaxies, by mass, the galaxies, so all of the gas, all of the stars, and all of the galaxies, makes up only about 5% of all the matter that's in a galaxy cluster. And so 80% of all the mass in a galaxy cluster is actually not even made up of normal matter, not matter that we can see or interact with via the electromagnetic spectrum, but it's made up of something called dark matter. Um, and we call this matter dark uh, because we're not able to point a telescope at it in any wavelength and see it. It's a particle of some sort, we believe, um, but we can't directly measure it yet. So we call it dark. And so the remaining 15% of the total mass in a galaxy cluster, uh, which makes up the majority of all the normal matter in the cluster, is actually in the form of this diffuse plasma um, called the intracluster medium. And so that's this purple plasma here, which is sort of permeating the space in between galaxies in the galaxy cluster. And so in a cluster, we have this huge amount of dark matter, this reservoir of very hot plasma, and then a sprinkling of galaxies on top. And so, you can take my word for it that these are extremely massive objects, um, but I think it's important to show you just how massive they are. So uh, we'll start with something familiar. Um, I did a quick Google search before this talk, and I found out that the average human mass is 137 pounds, which I find very weirdly specific. <laughs> Right, so we can take this mass of a human, which we can rationalize, you can see lots of other humans around you, and then we can bump it up a scale in magnitude. And so we can compare that with Mount Everest, which is over one trillion times as massive as a singular human being. One trillion human masses could fit inside Mount Everest. But as we know, there are larger things than Mount Everest in our universe. 
and the Earth itself is over 10 billion times as massive as Mount Everest. Right, so we can go up from there. The sun itself is over 100,000 times bigger than Earth. Right, so the sun provides all of the thermal radiation, all of the heat, the warmth that keeps us alive here on Earth, and it's over 100,000 times as big as Earth. But the universe doesn't stop at the sun. And so the Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy which the sun, which we reside in right now, is over a trillion times as massive as the sun. And we can keep going like this. A group of galaxies, which is a small number of galaxies all bound together, is over 10 times as massive as the Milky Way galaxy. And then finally, we arrive at galaxy clusters, which contain hundreds to thousands of galaxies, and they're over 10 times as massive as a galaxy group. And see, those, these are truly enormous scales, like it's almost incomprehensible. And so the main question that I'm going to be talking about uh, throughout this talk um, is how did galaxy clusters grow to be so large? And how do they continue growing currently into even larger structures in the universe today? And if you've paid attention to anything that's been said so far, you can infer that the answer to this is by merging. Um, so what I'm going to show here is what we call a cosmological simulation. So it's a simulation which we've run on a computer, and we've started it when the universe was extremely young, when it was only about 5% of its current age. And so in this simulation, we're going to see the very first stars emerging in the universe. And so this simulation is going to show us not light itself, but temperature. So blue things, you can see a lot of them here, are going to be very cool. And then red things, which will show up later, are going to be very hot. And so we're going to start the simulation. And you can see there's this sort of filamentary structure permeating the space of this element of the universe, which we call the cosmic web. And this is a filamentary structure of gas and of stars, uh, which connects every point in the universe to itself. And where these filaments overlap are extremely dense. And so the very first stars formed at these intersection points, and they then uh, sort of collapsed into galaxies at those points. And you can see, now we have these groups of galaxies. There's two big ones here starting to form. And so as the galaxies fall into these groups, into these proto-clusters, uh, they begin to have more mass. So more galaxies have more mass, which means they have more gravity which means they're going to be start to pulling in even more material at an even faster rate. And so we can see these clusters begin to grow extremely quickly here. Um, and then because each of these clusters of galaxies has so much gravity and they're so near to one another, they're going to begin to pull each other in and they're going to start to merge into one object itself. And so this is something like what happens in a galaxy cluster merger. You have all of this gas being pulled in from the cosmic web, from the gravity of all the dark matter, all of the galaxies, all of the ICM in these clusters, and they're going to start to merge together. And then I want you to keep an eye on the middle here where it's starting to get really red in there. Just the moment when the two galaxy clusters collide, there's this massive shock wave, which is released by the merger. And so this is releasing an enormous amount of energy, and it's going to propagate outward and heat up the ICM to even higher temperatures. And so these simulations are really useful for placing galaxy clusters in terms of a cosmological context, so seeing how they grow in real time in our universe. And they're also really good for predicting the things that we might be able to see when we point our telescopes at these galaxy clusters. Um, and so the next question is, okay, we've run simulations of what we think galaxy cluster mergers should look like. How do we actually observe them? And so, as I've already betrayed to you, galaxy clusters mergers are extremely energetic. And this means that they emit energy all across the electromagnetic spectrum. So they emit a very long wavelength light in the form of radio waves, all the way up through the visible light that we can see with our own eyes, into really high energy X-rays even. And so each one of these wavelengths is going to tell us something different about the galaxy cluster mergers. And so they're all individually extremely useful. Um, and so I'm going to focus on two wavelengths in particular, the X-ray and the visible light. And then if we have time at the end, I'll also touch a bit on radio light and how we can use that in conjunction with the other two wavelengths to understand these mergers. And so I want to start with how we can probe galaxy cluster mergers with visible light. Um, so our primary instrument here is going to be a telescope very near and dear to everyone's heart, the Hubble Space Telescope. 
This is a visible light telescope or an optical telescope, which was launched uh, around 1990, so it's extremely old. It's in orbit around Earth, and it takes very beautiful images of galaxies, of stars, and it's a really powerful tool for studying the universe at visible wavelengths. And so if we want to study galaxy cluster mergers, uh, historically what astronomers would have done is they would have gone up with their telescopes and they would have scanned them across the sky and they would have looked for groupings of galaxies together on the sky. And that was extremely useful, um, but we've actually come up with a more modern tool which will allow us to study galaxy cluster mergers in even better depth. And this tool is called gravitational lensing. And so the premise is this. Imagine you call up your friends at NASA and you say, hey, we want to study a sample of galaxy cluster mergers. They are extremely energetic, they are extremely large, and they're super important for the development of structure in the universe. Uh, can you point the Hubble Space Telescope at a sample of galaxy cluster mergers? And imagine your friends at NASA say, yes, that's a great idea, let's do it. So then you have the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit around Earth, which is in the bottom corner here, and you're looking straight out towards a galaxy cluster. Now, the interesting thing is when you imagine that there's a galaxy very far in the distance behind the galaxy cluster merger, such that if you were looking straight towards the galaxy, the cluster would be in the way and you wouldn't really see a lot of light from it. So imagine that galaxy is emitting light in every direction. Some of that light is going to be coming straight towards us through the galaxy cluster. We're not gonna see much of that. Some of it's going to be pointed in every other direction, so we're not gonna see that either. But if you look at some of these rays of light being emitted from the galaxy, some of them are going to pass near the galaxy cluster. And because there's so much mass in the galaxy cluster, it actually has enough gravity to distort the path of the light, such that instead of whizzing past the galaxy cluster out into distant space, it's going to be bent in towards the Earth. And we're gonna be able to see that light. And so the result of this is going to be multiple lensed images of the background galaxy. And if you don't believe me, uh, we can take a look at this beautiful image, which was taken by JWST, I think sometime last year. This is one of the earliest press release images. Um, and you can see in the middle here is a galaxy cluster called SMAX 0723. It's a very creative name. Um, but those galaxies are the, uh, the white sort of elliptical ga galaxies. And then you can sort of see all these concentric, streaky looking galaxies around the galaxy cluster. And these are the gravitationally lensed images of background galaxies. So in addition to being really beautiful, uh, we can use them to do something really cool. So we can look at one of the galaxy clusters that we've asked NASA to take an image of for us. In this case, this is Abel 1689. I did not actually take this image. Um, and you can see you have all of the galaxies in the cluster in addition to the gravitationally lensed background galaxies here. So now the cool part is we can say, we know that the only thing which is bending the light of the background galaxies is the force of gravity. And that force of gravity is being generated by all of the mass in the cluster. So what we can do is we can create a model which takes all of the gravitationally lensed galaxies and we can then infer what the total matter distribution which is bending that light looks like. And then we can recall that galaxy clusters are largely dominated by dark matter. And so what you get from this gravitational lensing model is actually a map of the total dark matter distribution in a galaxy cluster. So we can use visible images of galaxy clusters and gravitationally lensed background galaxies to create a model of the total dark matter distribution in clusters. And so this is extremely powerful. And so, uh, once we've now come up with a tool which can help us see the dark matter in these galaxy clusters, uh, the natural question is, but how do we observe all the normal matter? That ICM, the hot plasma, is dominating all of the normal matter in these clusters. How do we observe that? And the answer is with the x-rays. And our primary tool for this is going to be a beautiful spacecraft called the Chandra X-ray Observatory. And it's actually really important that this telescope is in space because Fortunately for us, er, X-rays from space are really bad at making their way through the atmosphere and onto Earth, which is good for us because it means we're not constantly irradiated by X-rays. But it's really bad for studying galaxy cluster mergers with X-rays. 
And so we've built this satellite, among several others, to go out into orbit around Earth and take some observations for us. So now imagine we've called up NASA again, and we've said, hi, thank you for taking our Hubble images. Can you now point the Chandra X-ray Observatory at these sets of galaxy cluster mergers so we can compare what the normal matter is doing to what the dark matter is doing? And let's say our friends at NASA are super compelled by this. They think it's a great idea. And they come back to us with these beautiful images in the X-ray here. And so these are actual X-ray images of galaxy cluster mergers in various states of merging. And so we can see that a lot of really cool things are happening in these mergers. They're starting to get really mixed up. And the ICM is uh, becoming very distorted in some of the mergers. But before we can actually dive into these, I think it's important to understand why galaxy clusters and galaxy cluster mergers actually even emit light in the X-ray. And so there's this distinction here that needs to be made between a classical gas and a plasma. And so in a classical gas, like the Earth's atmosphere, you have a bunch of positively charged nuclei. Sometimes it can just be a single proton. Um, and in each one of these positively charged nuclei, you have a bound negatively charged electron. And so the electron and the positively charged nuclei are going to whiz around together in the classical gas. And it's going to be pretty neutral. And fortunately for us, classical gases, like the atmosphere, don't emit in the X-ray. But if you heat that gas up to an extremely high temperature, you can actually strip the electrons off of the positively charged nuclei, such that what you have is this ionized soup of positively and negatively charged atoms, which are just floating around in space. And the ICM, the intercluster medium, is a very highly ionized plasma, like this. Right, so why does a plasma emit in the X-ray then? So if you imagine you're a positively charged nucleus and you're sitting somewhere in the ICM, eventually an electron is gonna come whizzing by you. And as it comes whizzing by you, you're going to be, feel attracted to that electron because it's very similar to the analogy of magnetism. If you have two bar magnets and you put the north end of one next to the south end of the other, they're going to attract, opposites attract. It's the same thing for electrostatic charges. And so that electron is gonna come whizzing by you and it's gonna feel an attractive force, which means its path is gonna be distorted ever so slightly um, as is shown here. And as that path is distorted, the electron's gonna lose a tiny bit of velocity. It's gonna slow down a little bit. And so in other words, it's gonna lose a tiny bit of energy. And that energy that it loses when it's being deflected is just enough to emit an X-ray photon. And so this is happening all throughout the ICM. You have positively charged nuclei and negatively charged electrons generating X-rays uh, extremely well. And our German friends have dubbed this Bremsstrahlung, which just means breaking radiation. But it's the reason why we can see X-rays from the ICM. So let's go back to our X-ray maps of galaxy cluster mergers that our friends at NASA have taken for us using the Chandra X-ray Observatory. So now we can understand what the ionized plasma in the ICM is doing, which, remember, is what most of the normal matter in this galaxy cluster is. So we have maps of what the normal matter is doing when you collide two clusters together. And now we can go back to our Hubble images, find our old gravitational lensing models, and overplot our maps of what the dark matter is doing. And so this is a sample of six different galaxy cluster mergers um, with the dark matter overlaid on top of the normal matter. And the immediate thing that you notice here is that these two distributions for any merger do not agree. So in the top right hand corner, you've got this sort of clustering centrally peakedness of all the ICM in the middle. So that's the pink X-ray emission. And then on the outskirts, you've got this uh, dark matter distribution as evidenced by the gravitational lensing. So these two distributions don't agree. In the top middle panel, you have a complete decoupling in the sky of these two components. And you can see that this is true for all of the different mergers in this sample. And so really what this is telling us is that the normal matter in these cluster mergers is not behaving the same way as the dark matter. And so actually, the first direct empirical evidence for the existence of dark matter came from a galaxy cluster merger just like this. So this is the bullet cluster. And it's called the bullet cluster because there's one small galaxy cluster, which is sort of slamming its way through an even more massive cluster, much like a bullet. 
And so we've done the same thing here, um, where we've taken X-ray emission, um, which represents the normal matter, and we've overplotted that with the gravitational lensing model, which traces the dark matter. And because these are decoupled, we see that the normal matter cannot behave in the same way as the dark matter. They must be two different components. And we can better understand this by looping back to a simulation. And so I'm going to show a simulation here, and it's going to be a simulation of the bullet cluster merger. So the dark matter is going to be in blue, and the normal matter, the ICM, is going to be in pink. So we've started it, and the clusters are now merging. And you can immediately see that the normal matter, when the two clouds ram together, there's immediately effects. So there's drag forces, there's turbulence. The normal matter is being mixed up all in the middle um, at extremely high energies. But the two clouds of dark matter pass through one another largely unimpeded. So they don't seem to experience a lot of the drag forces, that turbulence, which is causing all of the normal matter to be clustered around the center. And so this is going to just show you what that looks like in various different directions. And so the cool thing that we can do with this by comparing how the normal matter behaves relative to the dark matter is we can estimate how well a theoretical dark matter particle could interact with itself. Um, we can place an upper limit on how well dark matter interacts with itself relative to how normal matter interacts with itself. And we call this a self-interaction cross-section. But really what it does is it tells us what types of particles dark matter could be. And so this is extremely useful. Great, and so the, the last wavelength that I wanted to kind of bring into the fold here are very long wavelength radio waves. Um, and in particular, looking at things called radio relics. And so if you think back to the cosmological simulation that I showed you, you remember that as the two cluster mergers collided with one another, there was a massive shock wave which was uh, generated. And as that shock wave propagates outward through the ICM, through that ionized plasma, it's going to reaccelerate a lot of electrons which were buzzing around in that ionized uh, soup. And those electrons are going to emit light in radio waves. And so we can take these radio relics um, and we can use them in combination with our X-ray data to say something cool. And so this image here shows four different galaxy cluster mergers. It's worth noting that the time scale for a galaxy cluster merger is on the order of billions of years. So if we take an image of a galaxy cluster merger today, and we take another image of the same galaxy cluster merger in 100 years, it's going to look largely the same. And so we can't really make time series and watch how these cluster mergers evolve in real time. But what we can do is compare different galaxy cluster mergers in various stages of evolution. And so these are four different galaxy cluster mergers um, where the top is several billion years before the cluster merger impact, and the bottom one is shortly after the impact. And so just walking through this, we have the X-rays in blue showing what the ICM, or what the majority of the normal matter is doing. And in the top, you can see that the normal matter associated with the two clusters is largely undisturbed in each cluster. It's pretty spherically symmetric, and not a lot of interesting things are happening in these images. But that begins to change as we look at mergers which are older, which have evolved for longer. In particular, if you look at the second image from the top, about half a billion years before the impact of the two clusters, uh, you can see that the ICM is starting to get mixed up. It's starting to experience some of those forces uh, which were causing the behavior that we saw in the previous simulation. And that's in the X-ray. But now we've overlaid the radio data in pink. And so we can see in the middle here these two streaks of radio emission, which are called radio relics. Um, and what these do is they tell us about the shock waves just as they're being formed in this cluster merger right before the impact of the two clusters. And then if we look at a cluster about half a billion years after the impact, we can see that the ICM is hugely disturbed. We don't even see two cluster cores anymore. We just see one distribution which has been mixed up through all of the, the forces at play there. Um, but we do see that the radio relic tracing the shock has exceeded the extent of the ICM. And so it's propagated outward so far from the center of the cluster merger. And these radio relics are really interesting uh, because they tell us about the mechanisms 
which uh, actually induced those shocks and how those shocks propagate through the intercluster medium. And so because of the extreme energy scales that these galaxy cluster mergers are playing at, uh, we can't actually reproduce nearly any of these effects in laboratories on Earth. They're just too extreme. There's too much energy on too large of scales going on here to reproduce physically. Um, and so these are our optimal laboratories to study the way that physics behaves on really extreme scales. And the evolution of these shock waves is something that we can then loop back full circle with our simulations with to try to understand. And so we can then run computer simulations to try to generate the same features in the radio relative to the X-ray images um, and test our knowledge of really extreme physical processes. Yeah, um, so um, if you get nothing else from my talk here today, um, it's good to know that galaxy clusters are the largest and most massive objects in the universe that are held together by their own gravity. And they've primarily gotten that large and continue to grow by merging with other clusters. And these galaxy cluster mergers are the most energetic phenomena in the universe aside from the Big Bang itself. Um, and the mergers can actually answer really exciting questions. So contextually, how massive structures form in the universe, um, but they can also tell us really exciting things about the nature of dark matter and physical processes at really extreme scales. So I think that's all I have. We, we can take some questions for our speaker. Are there any questions from the, from the audience? Yeah. Yeah, here. I'll give you the mic. So everybody... Hi, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to use the wrong terminology, so I apologize. Um, both your simulations and the images that we saw, you pointed out the differences between the effects of the dark matter and the collision and the normal matter. At what scale are those changes happening? Does, it, does there anything, uh, does, the, does the collision actually affect the smaller scale structure of galaxies themselves within that supercluster? Or is it just on the huge large scale that we see those changes? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the reasons why we see this massive decoupling between what the dark matter is doing and what the normal matter is doing is because of the extreme length scales involved. So if we were to look at a smaller collision, there likely could be some you know, difference or decoupling between the dark matter and the normal matter, but it's on such small scales that it's really difficult to observe. In galaxy cluster mergers, the scales are so extreme that it's impossible not to notice in many cases. Um, so I can't speak to, to what extent this occurs on every scale, um, but it's particularly observable here because of the large scales. Yeah, great question. Other questions? Oh. Getting my exercise in here. So I came in a little late, so I'm not completely sure about the gravitational lensing part, and I was wondering like, how you measure that. As you mentioned, we're not there's no way to like observe dark matter. So yeah. I was wondering how that process and that mechanism for understanding that there is something there without knowing that something is there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm sure there are others in the audience who missed it walking in late as well. The concept of gravitational lensing is that if you are using a telescope around Earth, like the Hubble Space Telescope, and you've pointed it towards a galaxy cluster, um, you should imagine that there is a distant galaxy very far in the background, and that galaxy is emitting light in every direction. Some of it's going to be pointed towards us, some of it's going to be pointed away from us. Um, and so some of the light is actually going to pass near the galaxy cluster, and that galaxy cluster is extremely massive, so it has a lot of gravity. And the gravitational force as that light passes by the cluster is actually enough to bend the path of the light. So instead of going past the galaxy cluster and out off into space, the, get, or the gravity of that cluster is gonna pull that light in towards Earth. And so we're gonna see these sort of multiply lensed galaxy images around either side of the cluster. And then once we have those sort of streaky images of the galaxies in the background, which have been gravitationally lensed, 
we know that gravity is the thing bending the light of that galaxy. And we know that that gravity is caused by all the mass in the galaxy cluster. So we then make a model. Since we have all of these gravitationally lensed images, we can infer what the total mass distribution, which is bending that light, looks like. And then galaxy clusters are predominantly composed of dark matter. About 80% of the total mass of a cluster is in dark matter. And so when we make a, a model of what the total mass distribution looks like, what we're effectively doing is making a map of the dark matter. Yeah, no worries. Are, are all galaxies associated with the cluster? Uh, so in this image, no, definitely not. So in this image, uh, this is of Abel 1689, uh, which is the galaxy cluster. And the galaxies associated with the cluster are these sort of elliptical ones. Um, so largely the ones up in the middle there. Um, and so in particular, the galaxies which are being gravitationally lensed are very far in the background. They're very distant galaxies, not associated with the galaxy cluster. They're just farther back in space. And so lots of these galaxies are also not associated with the cluster. And part of the trick is figuring out which ones are. Any other additional question? Um, do galaxy clust clusters generate any other wavelengths of light? Absolutely. Yeah, to my knowledge, I think they emit in nearly every wavelength. And so you can observe these with microwave light, with infrared light. Um, you can observe them maybe less well in the ultraviolet, um, but they emit continuously across the electromagnetic spectrum. It's just very easy to observe them in x-rays because of the processes which I described here. The ICM is a huge x-ray emitter, so it's very bright. And it's very easy to identify galaxies in the optical light, um, but they do emit in other wavelengths as well. Yes. Um, and like when, uh Galaxy clusters, they uh, like when they um, merges, like it gets really hot, right? Indeed. Um, does, is it hot enough for nuclear fusion to occur? Like, like yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. The number uh, that I want to give you is going to be in Kelvin. Um, and so the temperatures of the ICM can get heated up to 10 to the 8 Kelvin, um, which is. 100 million Kelvin. Yeah, I don't exactly have a good reference for you, um, but yes, they're extremely hot. Um, so regarding that image on the right, the distribution of dark matter, Yeah. Is so I understand that the galaxies that are farther out from the center, that's presumably just closer to the center of the galaxy. Is there anything intrinsic to more the center of that galaxy cluster why it has so much dark matter is it just yeah. not detectable uh is it not are you not able to differentiate between the center of the galaxies when they're that close together or is there something else there that's contributing yeah so if you imagine what all of the dark matter looks like in a galaxy cluster <clears throat> it actually looks somewhat we can derive profiles for what this looks like and what you see is that there's more dark matter associated with the cluster at the very center so there's the most dark matter in there, and then it falls off radially towards the outskirts. So it's sort of, you can consider it like a sphere of dark matter, but it's most dense at the center. Does that answer your question? Yes, but I have a follow-up that ties that out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if that's the case, mm -hmm. is, is it known whether the dark matter is what's making, what's pulling things towards the cluster, or is the fact that the cluster is there somehow causing dark matter to accumulate around a chicken or egg question basically oh you've asked a very good question uh so the way that we believe the very uh the smallest structures in the universe began to form first was in slight over densities um so you have this density field and there's these slight over densities where a lot of matter can be drawn in and primarily this is going to be dark matter and so you have these huge dark matter wells with normal matter in them but the dark matter outnumbers the normal matter by so much that that's primarily what's influencing the dynamics of this collapse. Yeah, great question. Great question. Uh, perhaps one more question before we go to the break, when then we have the Q&A panel where you can ask all the rest of your questions if you wish, but perhaps we'll just take one more for Emily directly. Any, any takers? Yeah.
Um, I have a question. It might be like a really simple one, but what is dark matter made out of other than the matter? Yeah, so that's not a simple question at all. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, it's an open question, i.e. nobody knows the answer, right? So we only call it dark matter because it behaves like a particle, like normal matter, but we can't see it. We don't know what it is. We can see its effects. So for here, we know that there's more matter in this cluster than what we see. We just don't know what it is at all. So if you answer that question, you will probably win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Emily. Let's thank our speaker. Wonderful talk, Emily. All right, so now comes the, the time where we have a choose your own adventure. We're gonna set up a Q&A panel in here over the next hour. It'll take us two minutes to get set up and we'll be happy to answer your questions, both on continued questions about the content of, of the presentation or perhaps other questions you have about astronomy or physics or space science, perhaps something you read in the news or something that's been bothering you. We'll do our best to field them. There will be four of us members of the department who work on different areas of research. And alongside that, they now have the telescope set up on the fields behind us. Those will be operating until 940 or so, so you have an hour. Um, in particular, Saturn is rising, but it isn't yet uh, much above the horizon because there are trees in the way. So the later you go out there, the better likelihood you have of seeing Saturn. Um, they're also looking at the first quarter moon. You can try and make out the spot where the Indian mission landed uh, two days ago, the Chandrayaan uh, 3 mission. And then um, I believe they're looking at the Whirlpool galaxy, but they'll move around to different targets over the course of the night. So you can join us here, you can join us out there, or you can go back and forth between. And, uh, and remember, we do these once a month and we have Astronomy on Tap and just check us out online. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we'll, we'll get started with the Q&A in just a moment. Uh, the one note is I'll sit most closely to this end of the map. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 
Thank, thank you to all of, of you who stuck around for the exciting Q&A panel. Um, what we'll start out with is just having each of us kind of introduce who we are and what sort of science we work on. Um, we can answer questions on other topics as, as a whole. We can you know, figure out the answer perhaps if we don't know off the top of our head, uh, but just to give you an idea of what our specialties are in. I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I am a, a researcher here. I primarily work on Galaxy evolution, understanding how galaxies form, how they change over uh, many billions of years in some cases, and they make up, they're kind of the building blocks behind the clusters that, that Emily was discussing today. And I primarily do these studies using computer simulations, very large uh, models to, to simulate how these things are changing on very long timescales because it takes long timescales for them to change. If you if you look at an image of Andromeda galaxy or some other galaxy in the sky and you compare that image today with what it looked like 100 years ago, there's not a lot of bulk level change because the, the timescales are so long over which these things evolve. So, so we really need to utilize computer simulations where we can artificially speed up time to see how they change on more long timescales instead of just waiting around aging and, and, uh, and we, we don't get to see much. So anyway. Hi, yeah, I'm Emily. You've heard from me. Um, I, <laughs> I study galaxy cluster mergers, um, as I, I showed in the presentation. Um, you can also feel free to ask me anything about x-rays in particular. It's my favorite wavelength. Um, so yeah. Is this on? Oh, there we go. Hi, my name is Caitlin. I'm another graduate student here at Caltech. Um, I graduated from UCLA in 2021 and also had a degree in astrophysics. And I'm also studying astrophysics here right now in this department. Um, I primarily specialize in exoplanet characterization and detection. So exoplanets are planets that are outside of our solar system. So anything that's not Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, etc. Um, and we look to look and find and detect those planets. And so to date, we have over 5,000 planets outside of the solar system we've already discovered. Um, my group in particular also specializes in characterization. So what that means is we basically look after we detect an exoplanet at its atmosphere to see if there's any signs of life in particular. So to see if there's things like ozone or methane that we see in Earth's atmosphere that could also lead us to believe that there might be life outside of our own solar system. I'm Sam. Um, I'm also a grad student here. Unlike Cameron and Emily, who work on things that exist on very long time scales, I primarily deal with astrophysical transients. So these are things that appear and disappear in the sky over the course of a couple years, or perhaps the duration of a PhD thesis. <laughs> um, uh, I mostly, I graduated from UC Berkeley last year, two years ago, I don't know, um, not that long ago, uh, where I mostly worked on understanding the population of compact objects that might exist within our Milky Way. So these are things that are formed from dying stars. Um, I'm still very interested in compact object formation. So I study supernova explosions and the deaths of massive stars and also uh, less massive stars um, and how they end their lives uh, is something I'm also really interested in. I've been on a bit of a James Webb Space Telescope kick lately. Um, so I've been studying a lot of infrared transients, um, which tend to be very dusty and self-obscured. So if you've ever been outside on a, after a fire or something, um, and you've seen how the sun appears very red, um, that's because of a lot of the particulates you see in the atmosphere. Some astrophysical transients have their own particulates surrounding them 
uh, which we call somewhat vaguely dust, uh, which make them appear very red, and that's very well suited to study with James Webb, uh, which is an infrared telescope and studies things at these very red uh, long wavelengths. But yeah. Questions. All right. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on two of the questions that were asked after the lecture. So the first was, you talked about uh, determining which, whether galaxies belong to the cluster in the images that in response to this gentleman's question over here. But are there galaxies that don't belong to any cluster? In other words, just free floating galaxies, you're nodding yes. So. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, there's plenty of those as well. Um, actually, I think not even the majority of galaxies live in galaxy clusters. Lots of times they're grouped together in smaller groups of galaxies. I mean, the Milky Way galaxy that we're in right now is in a smaller group of galaxies. Um, and so sometimes you do have galaxies on their own. Um, sometimes they're in really cool environments like clusters, really extreme. Maybe they're in the center of that cluster and they're undergoing lots of heating and lots of really dramatic physics. But sometimes they are on their own too. And then the second follow up was to a question from the back about what happens on large and small scales of these mergers. So what wasn't clear to me from from the answer whether you explained are individual galaxies within galaxy clusters are 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 they uh reshaped when these larger clusters merge uh necessarily i guess it could depend on the nature of the mergers and how close together they are with other, other galaxies but there's a lot of empty space in these clusters so it wouldn't mm -hmm. seems like it wouldn't necessarily be the case that they would be yeah no reshaped. that's that's a great question. Um, so the galaxies are spaced out pretty well, such that when you have mergers, actually the majority of galaxies just pass right through one another along with the dark matter. And so when we say that the dark matter is sort of collisionless, it doesn't interact with itself very well, the galaxies sort of trace that dark matter. They're also somewhat collisionless because you can imagine they're just little point particles on a bigger density field and they just pass through one another. And so you can have galaxy merger events, and Cameron can maybe talk about that more if you're interested, um, but that's not necessarily the overwhelming effect in a galaxy cluster merger. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a very good question. I guess I can add to that. Um, yeah, Emily, Emily's absolutely right that, that dark matter is primarily collisionless and it kind of passes through each other. But even stars, for instance, you know, You've, I'm sure you've heard that the Andromeda galaxy, our nearest massive gal galactic neighbor, is on a crash collision course with the Milky Way and in the future will merge. But for the most part, the, the stars, people are like, oh no, are we going to, is the Earth going to get hit by a, a star or whatever? And for the most part, we don't predict, like the likelihood that any stars in the Andromeda galaxies, 100 billion or so stars, and, and, or any of the stars in the Milky Way, it's unlikely that any of them will actually directly hit because most of the most of the volume of those galaxies is just space. Um, it's the gas that's that that will have a, a collisional effect, much like you saw in that bullet cluster image or some of these other that nice animation that that Emily showed at the end. So it's the the gas that can have these drag effects on each other, but for the most part, both the, the stellar component, the stars themselves, and the dark matter. It, it won't, both in galactic collisions or in these larger cluster systems. But if enough gas collides, will that form new stars? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes it will. Um, so that is the, okay, so that is the thing that people worry about. I mean, people aren't really worried because the collision of the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy won't happen for you know, it'll be a continuous event that lasts a couple billion years, and it's going to be on the order of like five to eight billion. Like it'll start at about five billion years in the future and take about three billion years for it to kind of coalesce and complete. But during that time scale, sure, the stars themselves won't collide. The planets themselves probably won't collide either. But yes, the gas will, 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 will collide, and that compression effect is predicted to induce new generations of stars. Stars come from gas. They come from tight knots of gas that become gravitationally bound and then collapse under their own weight to form really dense little knots that are eventually what we call stars. So this, we do predict that this will happen in these sorts of events, and then there'll uh, 
Some of those stars will be very massive. Those massive ones will turn into supernovae. And we don't want supernovae and young stars to be around us because we'll get irradiated. But as I always say, we have much bigger fish to fry in the next 5 billion years before that, if we're to survive that long. We get swallowed by the sun. Yeah, we'll get swallowed by the sun. We'll probably do horrible things here on Earth. So, so I'm, not, I'm not super worried about the long distant, you know, long term future. You want to add on that? Sam? Yeah, to, to add on to Cameron's point, um, in galaxy mergers, uh, where you have a lot of new star formation, um, you form a lot of these massive stars. So massive stars are very short lived, they sort of live fast, die young. Um, and when they die, they die explosively. Uh, so in galaxies that are emerging, you actually see an above average supernova rate. So the Whirlpool galaxy, which I think is one of our targets for tonight. Is they're is, looking at it right now. It's a great example of this. So uh, you know, on average, maybe a supernova in a normal galaxy happens every 100 years or so. Uh, but in the, uh, the Whirlpool galaxy, which is sort of absorbing its kind of smaller friend galaxy um, and merging and having this new burst of star formation, there have been three in the last 25 years. So that's, if I could do math, uh, quite a bit, <laughs> like some fraction more than uh, the average rate of just like one every hundred years. It's so sort of the connection between those galaxy mergers and then the supernova, um, which you see then see it at increased race because you those uh, increased number of massive stars. So yeah, check out the Whirlpool. Very cool galaxy. Whirlpool, yeah. Additional questions? Yeah. Uh, is, is our local group, is that considered a cluster? The triangular? Yeah. Yes. Local group um, is not a cluster in and of itself, um, but that group is within a larger cluster. Um, yeah, so the Milky Way is in a cluster of galaxies, which is really large. But the local group is just a small grouping on smaller scales, yeah, small so, in astronomical terms. Exactly. So our local group is a reasonably smallish group consisting, as you, as you already pointed out, the three kind of big big galaxies in it are the Milky Way, the Andromeda Galaxy, and the Triangulum Galaxy. And we should be able to see both the Andromeda and Triangulum Galaxies. I mean, it's obviously pretty faint here, but if you were in a dark sky site, you'd be able to see both of them. They both appear reasonably close to each other on the sky. Um, cool to look at. But there is a number of dwarf galaxies, lower mass systems that are orbiting each of these three or kind of the, the, the compilation of all, th all three of these. So um, I forget the exact number, but it's on the order of a couple dozen per. So there's, you know, on the order of like 40 or 50 dwarf or galaxies in this whole local group system, but these clusters are, are much, much larger. I'll get to that in a second. What is the uh, frequency of these galaxy cluster, cluster mergers? about galaxy cluster mergers is that they're very far away from us oftentimes. Um, and so they're somewhat difficult to observe in that regard. They're not super common um, because as I mentioned, they are currently what's forming in the universe and what's growing in the universe right now. So they're less abundant than say the number of galaxies in the universe. Um, and so our actually our sample of well studied galaxy cluster mergers is relatively small compared to our sample of supernovae that we've studied really well. Um, I think maybe even compared to our exoplanets that we've studied uh, fairly well, though Caitlin might be able to comment on that more. Um, but they're not all that common in the universe and they're extremely interesting to study because of that. Thank you. Um, two questions. Uh, so one is, um, are galaxy clusters the largest grouping that we that we have currently um, defined? And uh, what is the what is the life of a galaxy cluster uh, projected to be? Thank you. Could you repeat the first part of your question? I think I, I may have missed that. Sorry. Uh, just is a uh, galaxy clusters are those like the largest kind of defined groupings? Uh, you know, or are there like uh, clusters of galaxy clusters, you know? Yeah, yeah. So we say that galaxy clusters are the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe. So they're held together by their own self-gravity. 
Whereas if you start to have a lot of clusters which have merged together, um, you can arrive at what we call a super cluster, which is just a really, really large cluster. Um, and so these are, these are sort of somewhat gravitationally bound, but they're largely still actively merging as well. Um, you do have this sort of structure which I was describing, which permeates the universe, um, called the cosmic web, which has a lot of the gas in which galaxies and stars are formed and it connects the points of the universe together. But that structure is not gravitationally bound. It's not one object with, you know, a center and a boundary or something like that. Not that it's particularly easy to describe like the center of a merger, which is really extreme. Um, but yes, so we say that clusters are the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe. And your second question was, what's, what's the life? Like the life or? of a, what's the prospects? <laughs> what's one day in the life of a galaxy cluster? Yeah. Yeah, so one cool thing about galaxy clusters is that they're sort of approaching the limit of the largest structures that will ever form in our universe. So our universe, um, as many of you will know, is expanding. And not only that, but we have this force called grav or dark energy, which is accelerating the expansion of the universe, which means that on large scales, every point in the universe is getting farther away from every other point even faster. And so it's going to be even hard for structures to form in the universe. And so galaxy clusters and superclusters are sort of like the ultimate cosmic structure um, in that we're not going to see things too terribly much like bigger than that. Um, so its life is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here, close. Sure. <laughs> I was wondering if computer science is related to astronomy, and if it is, could you like explain that a little bit? Absolutely it is. Yeah. yeah. I think every one of us has something to say on that, so I'll pass <laughs> the mic very soon. Um, but yes, computer simulations are a huge part of understanding galaxy cluster mergers because they're so complex that we require computers to generate images of what could possibly be happening in them. Um, but I'll, I'll pass it on to both Sam and Caitlin, who I'm sure have other things to add. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point about simulations. I think that's something we haven't quite touched upon either is instruments themselves. So Emily did a great job talking about the different types of telescopes that are used um, to make observations in different wavelengths. And there's a really robust group of people who work on things called data reduction pipelines. So essentially what they do is they take the images that you see from space and basically say, okay, we have all this light and we funnel it all into this giant light bucket, which is our telescope. How do we turn that light into useful science? How do we turn it into things like velocity measurements or how bright this object is? And so there's a lot of people who spend a lot of time writing computer software to take what we can see in the universe and convert it into something that we can use for science to kind of answer some of these bigger questions about it. Yeah, Caitlin talked. To, um, Caitlin and Emily both have great great answers about simulations and also just getting data from the telescopes. I'll maybe add to that um, as someone who works on transients. Um, observing the whole night sky every two nights, we see an absurd number of things every day. And you have to be able to sort through those things, what's interesting, what's not. And it's really early in astronomy, you know, you would have photographic plates and people would be able to look at every image by hand. Um, but we're getting to the point where we're just generating so much data um, that in order to parse through it all, we need to use computers. Um, so people are working on machine learning algorithms and stuff to recognize interesting transients in the night sky and then pass those on to human astronomers. Uh, this will be even more important with sort of the next generation of transient surveys. So I work in the Zwicky Transient Facility, sort of a small-ish telescope on uh, Palomar in San Diego, but the next generation of, of transient surveys, uh, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or Rubin, um, will be, it's like a three meters? Oh god, it's big. It's much it's, bigger than ZTF. Like eight, Sorry? I think it's eight meters. It's eight meters? Oh, yes. Okay, so <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, it's going to generate an absurd number of uh, transients every night that there's no possible way that human scanners like myself could ever look through them. We're going to need to develop computer programs to sift through that data and show us what's most interesting um, to look at and we'll advance our knowledge the furthest. And I think that's going to be really important uh, going forward. Um, just to tack on to what the other panelists have said, 
I agree with everything that you guys have said. And the only thing that I'd add is that not even just astronomy, but essentially, so I studied computer science at, at university before I kind of went into doing physics and astronomy. And basically every scientific physical science and, and most, uh, most sciences have some level at the, in, in this age, have some level of coding, have some level, level of software design in order to process the data, in order to design instruments, in order to, to analyze the results, there's some aspect. So I think it's super beneficial to have some level of background in how to program or how to, how to write software and, or how, even just how to understand how those things work for your, if, if you wanna pursue a, uh, you know, a career in sciences or even lots of other, other careers. So yeah, that's, that's just what I'd add. Um, additional questions. Don't worry, I'll, I'll get to you, Kenneth. Didn't the James Webb Telescope discover a galaxy early on in the universe that should not have been there because it's too big? And did that disrupt our model? Do you, do you guys want to? I can talk about this. So, um, the James Webb Space Telescope is, is making lots of discoveries in a, a variety of different fields, exoplanets, um, mo very notably, and especially in the media, lots of galaxy, early universe galaxy um, discoveries. And like human nature, scientists are like, oh, I wanna, I wanna discover the big thing or whatever. And so these data are coming out and different scientists are analyzing these sets of data, these images of distant galaxies, or they might be galaxies. We can't quite tell if they're as far away as we think they are. And some of those papers have made bold claims about things that haven't yet necessarily been corroborated. Um, one such claim that's being back, backed away a little bit is, so we are certainly seeing some very bright galaxies in the early universe, and we didn't necessarily expect there to be a huge population of very luminous objects at that kind of age of the universe. But certain scientists put out a couple of papers suggesting that those very bright systems, and of course, we, we can see their luminosity. That's what our telescopes see. They see the light coming from these systems. They're, they're making the prediction that because those things are so bright, they must be very massive. And it's not necessarily true. You can have systems that um, kind of pulse on and get brighter for a short period of time and then get fainter for a while and then get brighter. And we're just catching it at the very bright moment when it's very bright. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's quite as massive if you as it would be if it were bright all the time, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so um, not to name names of scientists in the community, but no, no, no I, don't wanna, I don't wanna piss people off. So um, uh, some of them are backing away from the initial claims where they said, oh, this is breaking our entire paradigm of galaxy evolution. We have to restart, rewrite all the books. And it's like, not, not really, not yet. It's still possible that they're, you know, this is an ongoing scientific study and how science works is, you know, people make hypotheses and we test those hypotheses and we see if in acquiring more data, if it backs up the, the hypotheses that have been made. But thus far, I don't think there's been anything that is outside, like so far outside the realm of what we expected to see that it's like causing us to, you know, pull out our hair in, in surprise. Um, but it, it is providing more certainty about things that were very uncertain in the early universe and what the state of galactic evolution and formation was in just the first few hundred million years after the, after the Big Bang. So it's very exciting, but we aren't yet like, oh, ah, you know, freaking out that something is, is broken everything. Sorry, you, if you guys want to add on. Okay. What about in, um, what about in exoplanets? Have there been any, I know, JW is doing all kinds of interesting stuff in the field of exoplanets and, and even solar system stuff as well. Do you know of anything that's like, has totally been a surprise or, or something not that stumped us? Not necessarily a surprise, but not exactly what we wanted. Okay. So raise your hands, folks in here, if you're familiar with the TRAPPIST system. Okay, we got some good hands. So the TRAPPIST system is, is a group of planets around a smaller star. So the sun is a G-type star, which is like roughly like middle kind of luminosity ground. And then you can kind of get the smaller stars. They're a little bit redder and they're a little bit cooler and they have less energy output. And so 
the Trappist system is around one of these cooler stars, and it has a bunch of planets that are roughly Earth sized or super Earth sized. And so what JWST was doing is people really wanted to look at some of these planets in the habitable zone of this particular star, which is pretty close in because the star is not as luminous as our sun. And people were really, really hoping to find atmospheres on these planets and be like, look, you know, we have this M star and this is great. And all of these planets around happen to be habitable and we can start looking, you know, for biosignatures here and for signs of life. Unfortunately, we found that it's not exactly consistent with having an atmosphere. So a lot of astronomers have been worried for a little bit that these smaller stars are actually more active than stars like our sun. So they have flares and they have a lot of activity going on where they kind of spurt radiation in all directions. And we are worried that that is stripping the atmosphere of these planets around. And unfortunately, JWST kind of confirmed, you know, an atmosphere that's not exactly compatible with you know existing really and so the the caveat to this is that we only can look with jwst in certain wavelengths and we can have you know molecules in different wavelengths in the atmosphere that could tell us more about it but at least in the regime that we were looking we're not really seeing the molecules that we were hoping for i don't know if anybody else wants to add on to exoplanet jwst information <laughs> but that was that was a big shocker yeah thank you Okay. Thank you for your patience. Um, you mentioned the universe expanding. What does that mean for galaxy clusters? So does that mean they just won't become clusters eventually or do they like implode on themselves well before that happens? Or I guess I'm just wondering what the future of a cluster would be. Yeah, so the good news for galaxy clusters is that though the universe is expanding, it has, or galaxy clusters themselves, have so much gravity um, in the bound system that they'll largely be able to overcome that expansion and stay bound together even though the universe is expanding because they have so much gravity and that gravity is stronger on smaller scales than the expansion of the universe. And so clusters largely, we don't think, are going to be torn apart by the expansion of the universe, but they'll be these sort of island universes where it's just a cluster with lots of galaxies, lots of ICM, lots of dark matter, um, but there aren't any nearby galaxy clusters because they've all been you know, stretched away as the universe has been expanded. Yeah, good question. I had been curious about each of you individually. How did you, what was the earliest time in your childhood that he said, oh, I want astronomy? And later on in college and so forth, in particular, how did he pick astronomy, let's say, as opposed to physics? Yeah, I can start um, ooh, Okay. Uh, the truth is, I mostly like explosions. And if you're really <laughs> into explosions on Earth, it's kind of frowned upon. Um, so I really, I needed to go to space. Um, I needed to you know, um, and it also I, supernova are just endlessly fascinating. I think they're the coolest things. I, um, I don't think I decided to be an astronomer until uh, I started undergrad. Um, I was originally physics uh, exclusively, and then I took an astronomy class, and then I sort of um, did both astronomy and physics. Uh, and I decided that supernova were way cooler than anything I could do in a lab. Um, and so I moved uh, pretty exclusively to astronomy, and then, of course, I'm doing my PhD uh, in astronomy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I didn't think about doing physics or astronomy until I was a senior in high school and took my first physics class. Um, originally, I wanted to be a lawyer. People told me, you know, oh, you can go and you can talk in front of folks, and I was like, that sounds like fun. But then I met some other, you know, classmates who were like, oh, I think it'd be fun to major in STEM and go to these great schools and have these fun sounding majors. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I'm like, what field of STEM do I like? And so I took a physics class in high school and I really enjoyed it. And I went, hmm, you know, what in physics could I do? What's interesting? And I was like, well, astrophysics is pretty interesting. And so I only applied to college with astrophysics majors. And then I picked a school and I just stuck with it. Um, 
it became something that I like was like, oh, this is interesting. If I, you know, want to switch my major later, I can. But at the same time, I found myself really enjoying it as I continued to go through the coursework. And so I was like, I guess I'll just not change my major and I'll stay. Um, but that's pretty much the story. I probably didn't know that I was going to do or be sitting in this room at least until like maybe like five or six years ago. Yeah, um, so I guess my story of how I, I found astronomy, um, it sort of began when I was younger. I always had an interest in science generally, um, but it wasn't until my senior year of high school that I had this sort of existential crisis about what to do with my life. And so part of me was like, oh, I could be a musician. I really like the flute. I could play that for a living. Part of me wanted to be a poet. Um, part of me wanted to be a neurosurgeon. And so as I was having this crisis, I was sort of self-reflecting on, you know, all of the things that I'd been interested in throughout my life. And I tried to pick one thread that had sort of remained constant. And so like I was a nerd as a kid, like my parents who are listening were really cool. They sent me to like a space summer school and I came home with a telescope and I was really excited about it. Um, yeah. And so I found out that sort of astronomy was like this one thread through my life, which has always been interesting. And so. I think like a week before classes started in undergrad, I decided I would major in astronomy and I immediately fell in love with it and have been doing it ever since. Um, I, my like s s introduction to astronomy is, is super trite. It's something that a lot of astronomers claim, you know, there was a, an amateur astronomy group in a parking lot at my elementary school when I was like 12 and I had the opportunity to go look through a telescope in a dark, you know, school parking lot and see Saturn. So that was really cool and I enjoyed it, but I wasn't necessarily convinced that I was going to do astronomy. I mean, kids, kids think they're going to be studying dinosaurs and, and driving hard, uh, you know, uh, like dump trucks and everything when they're little kids. So, uh, so who knew what I was going to do? I studied computer science, as, as we talked about before, as an undergraduate. And I really like writing software, writing code. I spent like 10 hours today writing code, and it's really cool. But a lot of the opportunities, especially many years ago when I finished my undergrad degree, um, for writing code are not things that I found fulfilling at the end of the day. You know, it's fun in the moment, but then later on, you're like, oh, I'm just writing code for some faceless organization or, or, or corporation or something like that. And I really like the idea of helping humankind to better understand the world around us in some capacity in the physical sciences, whether, whether that's astronomy or whether that's physics or chemistry or, or biomedical science or something like that. I think it's, I think it's a really like worthy endeavor to perform. And uh, ultimately, I was like, oh, I like, I like space. I like, I like stars. So I've chosen to like apply my coding skills towards doing, you know, help us better understand the physical environment of, of, of the earth and, and space. So that's my, that's my tale. Um, yeah, we'll get to all the questions. Um, incidentally, I was a high school senior 30 years ago and i'm still in existential crisis about what i want to be when i grow up so um anyway but my question was uh i conceive of dark matter as being like scaffolding upon which the normal matter is you know resting that's not the uh, it's probably a better word than that but in the simulations and in the images that you showed in the presentation uh it looks to be more pervasive um so I guess based on what we know about dark matter, understanding that we don't know a lot about it, uh, oh, is it really, is, is it kind of like co, uh, what's the word, like co, co-terminus or co concurrent with, um, with normal matter so that you're seeing, you have these like spheres of dark matter within which there are, there's visible matter as opposed to visible matter in between tendrils of dark matter is, is that making sense yeah yeah i think that's a really good question and oftentimes what you see when you look at structures forming in the universe and cameron can talk about this from a galaxy perspective as well um, is that you have these sort of wells of dark matter and they have so much gravity that they're pulling in a lot of the normal matter with them and the dark matter outnumbers the normal matter um, by weight, by mass, um, by so much that it's largely the dynamics of dark matter, which influences how these structures evolve. Maybe Cameron has something to add. I'm just going to, 
I'm going to try and do one of my like crummy illustrations of one of these systems. This is great. This is real science. So yeah, this is really bad illustration is what it is. So, so you're absolutely right that there's a coevolution. It's not, you know, one, one could easily think that because dark matter dominates the overall mass of the universe, over the the stuff that we're made of what the so-called baryonic matter of protons electrons and such that those that baryonic matter is just like tracer particles in that larger flow of the dark matter so in this case the blue points are are the baryonic matter the protons the electrons and such and the black is the dark matter and that you can do that and it works mostly but there are places where the density of normal matter is similar to the density of dark matter and where we do play we we the baryonic matter the normal matter does does like still pack a punch and still does help to dictate what the evolution of the entire system is doing but for the most part in most parts th these these black lines that i'm drawing are the cosmic web that emily alluded to kind of these collapsed filamentary structures that roughly look like a three-dimensional spider web in all directions and where the bulk of the mass of the universe lies in these in these filamentary structures and then where those filaments kind of coalesce and cross each other that's where clusters of galaxies form. And so these are on very, very large scales. This is not the scale of a solar system. It's not the scale of a, a cluster of stars. That's far too small. That's like a tiny pixel in this overall thing. These blue dots are for the most part like galaxies themselves. And then you might have a cluster of galaxies, many, many, many galaxies in the centers of these structures. But yes, the baryonic matter can be sufficiently massive in certain regimes usually in certain kinds of galaxies usually not so much in clusters of galaxies that you have to account for both the baryonic matter kind of uh affecting its environment by its gravitational force as well as the dark matter yeah he goes okay um i'm gonna get to people who haven't asked questions and you had a question so Uh, I was curious if there's any prominent theory for why dark matter in a collision doesn't behave doesn't behave like regular matter. All sorts of hypothetical particles, which we think could exist in the universe and could behave in the way that dark matter behaves. Um, the issue really comes down to differentiating between those particles. So narrowing it down, um, a lot of people are building, for instance, dark matter detectors, um, which are really sensitive detectors, which are trying to directly interact with a dark matter particle. Um, and then you could sort of identify what types of particles uh, could be causing these effects. Um, but it's really hard to differentiate between all of these hypothesized particles so far. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if Cameron has anything to add. No, that's, that's absolutely true. It's very difficult to measure this in a lab because it's not interacting with the normal baryonic matter in ways other than gravity. Uh, and there are models, as Emily said, for subtle ways in which two dark matter particles could interact. It's a theory known as self-interacting dark matter. There was some really important science done um, here at Caltech in this department by uh, a recent graduate student, Jacob Shen, who just who just defended his PhD. Notably, uh, he just gave a lecture about this stuff uh, two months ago or three months ago. So it's on the YouTube channel if you want to check it out. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a subtle effect when we see these sorts of systems like the bullet cluster. It's, not, it's definitely not behaving just like protons and electrons are. It, it can have a self-interaction cross-section, but it's, it's, it's much more it's much smaller and it's much more of a subtle effect. So it's, it's, it's challenging. So there are people who have theories for this, but we don't have any conclusive evidence one way or another that, that favors one or, or the next. Um, just as an aside, I wanna mention, if people haven't seen the telescopes yet and want to see something through the telescope, I encourage you to go out there. They're gonna shut it down in about 10 minutes or so. And probably, I don't know, for those of you who just came from outside, did you get a chance to see Saturn? 
You did? Okay, so they have Saturn. It's, it's visible now uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna see Saturn. Not to scare you away from our awesome Q&A panel, but, but uh, if you wanted to see it, I wanted to give you a chance. Okay, question here in the back. Uh, hello? I just, I sort of had like um, uh, two questions, I guess. The, the simpler one is, when galaxy clusters collide, do the individual galaxies you know, disintegrate? Do they collide with each other? Do they um, you know, fall into each other? And the second one is, so just as a clarification on like dark matter, is it, does it interact with itself? Does it like, is it as complex as regular, as like baryonic matter? Or is it just, it's just this thing that has to exist to make everything else work? Yeah, maybe we'll start with the second question. And I think the answer is it could interact with itself. It just doesn't seem to very strongly. Um, so thus far, when we look out at, for instance, a galaxy cluster merger, and we look at the way the dark matter behaves relative to all the normal matter, it looks pretty well like it's not interacting with itself all that much, and it's only interacting via gravity. That's why we've placed um, sort of upper limits, the maximum amount which a possible dark matter particle could interact with itself based off of what we see. Um, so it could interact with itself to a smaller degree than that. We just don't know yet. Um, and as Cameron said, there is a, a lecture on the YouTube uh, page which goes into this quite a bit from several weeks ago, um, if you're interested further. But yeah, um, if you just have the simplest dark matter model that you can, which is to say that there's no interaction whatsoever, you can match like 95% of the observations. It's just, like I said, it's a subtle thing in certain contexts, like in the cores of dwarf galaxies is a region in which we think there might be a high enough cross section to allow this self interacting nature and and one of the models that's been proposed is something known as atomic dark matter, which is where you have. A couple of like you have a dark proton and you have a dark electron and they make a dark atom that kind of a, a model and that allows you to fit certain parameter space of observations, but. By and large, if you take the simplest like vanilla model of dark matter, which is just to have this kind of collisionless non self interacting thing. It works really, really well. Here, I'll get you this so everybody can hear you, including the online crew. I'm sorry, I just so we don't like we can't so we can't interact with it. Like we it we 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 face through. We just see its gravitational effects and all that. So like you talk about things like dark atoms, dark protons. So if this is everywhere, if this is everywhere, so like it's like it's here. You know, we have like little bits of dark matter right here around it. Yeah, past us. And you talk about things like dark ions, dark protons. So you could have like complex interactions. Like there could be like, I guess, I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm a layman, so I'm not entirely sure what I'm saying. You know, like there could be like a, like a sh sort of dark shadow around us. Like you could have, I don't know, like a dark matter chair right in front of like, well, actually, you know, I'm, I'm. But we don't think, if I may, sorry. sorry, I don't mean to hog this because we have a whole panel of crew, but we don't think that uh, or there's no evidence that dark matter is is clustering on small scales smaller than a galaxy for the most part you wouldn't have a, a dark chair i understand what you're saying like we can have like kind of like the upside down we've got the shadow world of dark stuff that we can't just see with our eyes and it could exist and there could be a lot of complexity there we don't have necessarily a lot of evidence for that complexity but it could be there it could be dark stars these sorts of things that could exist we don't have evidence for it but in terms of the small scales, it doesn't appear that it's clustering on smaller scales than galaxies. You don't see an evidence for like a bunch of dark matter over density clustered on a solar system scale or around a star. It's mostly on, on larger scales. But yes, absolutely, there could be these fine structures that are occurring in a realm that we just have no capacity, at least currently, to, to, to view directly because of the low interaction rate between baryonic matter that we're made of and this, and this dark matter. Is that roughly? Okay. Um, I can't pass up. So I'm assuming you all went to, you all graduated high school, right? Mm -hmm. So would you suggest to make an early decision or a regular decision for, for college? college? Oh. Wow. 
It's a little bit probably too early, but. What do you think? Early decision. It's been so long since I thought about applying to college. I know, I feel somewhat unqualified to answer this question. Um, I think the, the wonderful thing about college is that you have an opportunity to, to explore things you never even considered before. Many of my friends in college weren't astronomers. Um, they studied other things, things that they never even thought about in high school. Um, so when you apply early decision, you're locked into a specific college. And if you really want to go to that college and you think it has a lot of great options for you, that's maybe the right choice. In the interest of full disclosure, I got rejected from the school I applied to early decision. And I think it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Um, I was very happy at Berkeley. I don't think I would have been as happy at um, Yale where I was rejected and rejected again for grad school. Uh <laughs> I, I, was, I was rejected at Caltech as an undergraduate. And here I am. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I think I think it's so hard to know um, exactly what things are. At, there are so many excellent colleges and so many excellent professors and excellent ways to do it. I think it's it's similar to when choosing a grad school, um, where there's only right choices. There aren't wrong ones. Um, so try not to stress. I know it's hard. Yeah, I really just want to emphasize what Sam said here that your college experience is whatever you want it to be, regardless of where you go. I think if you decide early decision somewhere and then you'll end up making the best of your opportunities there. If you decide to go somewhere regular decision, it's whatever you make it. So don't stress over it, I would say. <laughs> I couldn't echo those sentiments more. Also, I didn't apply anywhere early decision. Um, I didn't think I really knew it was a thing, truthfully at the time. And then the other thing too is, I think it's really important to go to the school that speaks to you. So I did my undergrad at UCLA, which I mentioned before, but I also got into Cornell. And my kind of story about that was a lot of people told me that I was stupid for going to UCLA. And why would I pass up the opportunity to go to an Ivy? But I went out and I visited the school and it really wasn't the place for me or the program. And when I visited UCLA, I kind of fell in love with the school and the people and the culture. And I really made my decision about where I went to school, about somewhere where I felt happy going as a person. So I was happy with my major changing or going into a different field or something like that. But I picked a school that I felt represented me and somewhere where I wanted to spend four years and spend some time growing up and learning about different things in the world. So, you know, Go to the school that you want to go to that you like that seems like you're going to have fun and a good time and try not to let some of these other pressures about you know college applications or where your friends are going and you know weigh on you it's um i don't know anybody who's really like regretted going to the picking the school that they wanted to go to versus the one that they maybe thought was like best for them or their career in the long term they said it all well i'm not i i, I can't add anything so it's, you won't have a bad decision. Choose, 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 like, people fret over, like, oh, this, ha this is the one I have to go to, and if I make the wrong decision, I'm going to be miserable. There are many good decisions, and, and you'll probably be happy at many of them. Okay, so from everything I heard, it sounds like Neutrino would be a good candidate. Dark matter, but there's not enough mass is what I've understood. So other than not having enough mass, is the characteristics of a, a neutrino a good candidate? Well, there certainly are models. Um, I guess I can go into a little bit of a technical detail here. Um, there's a particular type of neutrino. It's called a sterile neutrino. And there's a model of this sterile neutrino that says that it could decay um, into something which actually emits a photon at a particular energy. And so back to the X-ray wave band, um, there has been intensive study into what could be um, some extra photons at a particular energy, which could be consistent with a sterile neutrino model for dark matter. Um, and so many people have gone out with different telescopes um, and then effectively um, we're sort of limited by the resolution of our telescopes right now. Um, but we do have a fantastic generation of X-ray telescopes up and coming, which will be able to go up and definitively say 
whether or not we see this extra photon feature at a particular energy and whether or not that's consistent with the sterile neutrino hypothesis for dark matter. Um, there may be others as well, but that's the one that I'm aware of. There is a lab in this world of physicists that have a residence cavity and all they do for this residence cavity is they slightly adjust it and make tons, tons like to scan through as many wavelengths as possible to try and get some kind of dark matter decay. Um, they've predicted it'll take them a hundred years to test each and every single sort of resonant frequency in this cavity um, for these decays. Um, that's not how I would want to spend a hundred years. But there are people who, who study this and are, are looking for these decays. Um, I can't remember if it's exactly a neutrino that they're looking for with this particular experiment, but maybe. Um, yeah. It was my understanding that most neutrinos are a form of hot dark matter. I don't know how much you covered this. I was trying to read the questions online. Um, and for the most part, so when people refer in an astrophysical sense, well, not in all astrophysical senses, in a dynamic sense between cold and hot. It's not necessarily like, oh, that's cold, it's freezing my hand, and oh, that's hot, it's burning me. It's more the, the motion of the particles themselves. And the current favored paradigm for dark matter is what's known as cold dark matter. And that's because there's not enough internal motion in the Part particles or parcels of the dark matter to uh, that such that it can collapse and it can cluster around certain size scales or mass scales of structures. So we talked about galaxies, we talked about clusters of galaxies, we talked about this kind of cosmic web. And neutrinos tend to be hotter, they tend to be more energetic, and they tend to not cluster on those to those traditional scales and it would take more of them so they would cluster on larger scales and we know that dark matter from observations of galaxy rotation curves and these sorts of things that dark matter clusters on smaller smaller i mean it's not really small but galaxy scales whereas with ne most neutrinos and hot dark matter models they don't necessarily abide by that so it's i don't think in general neutrinos are as favored as a dark matter candidate as they were perhaps 20 or 30 years ago when we had, when it was more cosmological early studies in this, in this field. But that's a, that's a great question. Um, yes. Um, in your talk, you were um, talking about galaxy clusters merging. Um, and you didn't mention galaxy clusters like dividing or separating. And in high school, we learned in physics, and so this was years ago, I don't know if it's still valid, but uh, that the universe is constantly expanding. So I guess, are these galaxy clusters just going to merge and merge and merge and get bigger and bigger and all of the matter and dark matter of the galaxy is going to like cluster together? Or is it expanding and there's going to be these big clusters that just get further, further apart? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think we've touched on it a little bit previously, but yeah, as you've alluded to, the universe is expanding. Um, so every point in space is getting farther away from every other point, and it's even accelerating, so this expansion is getting faster. Um, the thing about galaxy clusters in particular is they're so large and they have so much mass, which means they have so much gravity, that means on small scales, small relative to the size of the universe, so on the scale of a galaxy cluster, that gravity can actually overcome the expansion of the universe and the cluster can stay gravitationally bound. And so I was talking about this a little bit earlier, but we sort of think that as the universe expands off to infinity, um, everything's gonna get farther away from everything else in the universe. And so these galaxy clusters are sort of the ultimate cosmic structure. So they're not gonna get a whole lot bigger than how they are now. And they're eventually just gonna become these sort of island universes. So everything else is so far away, but that cluster is largely remained bound to itself. Yeah. Cameron I, I did a really crummy illustration again, cause that's what I focus on. Um, and essentially the idea is this green line is supposed to represent kind of the space time in a one dimensional sense, instead of obviously a three dimensional or four dimensional sense, because it's hard to, for me to draw a one dimensional thing, let, let alone a three or four dimensional thing. And, and yes, indeed, the universe is expanding. And so over time, this is kind of like 
flattening out and these things are getting farther away from each other. But as Emily points out, because this thing is gravitationally bound, the yes, the space in between these is expanding, these individual galaxies in your cluster. But because it sits in a, a well, a gravitational well overall, they're going to collapse and fall to the center of that well on shorter time scale than that well is expanding outward. So yes, indeed, gravitationally bound structures will continue to be gravitationally bound, even though the space in between them is expanding. Whereas things that aren't bound to each other, these are just gonna get farther, these wells and these, super, these clusters are gonna get farther and farther away from each other because the space in between them is expanding. Sorry, that was just to muck up your explanation with my horrible illustrations. Um, there was a question in the back and then I'll... You've been very patient. I think this question is more directed towards you, actually. So in terms of the computational side of things, I have like a two-pronged question. The first is generally what is involved in the computation of things? Is it like data processing or is it generating the mathematical models that underlie all of the mechanisms that are being discussed? And a second thing is about like how the data comes <laughs> um, packaged, I guess, and how, for example, the images that we see on the interwebs, um, how those come to be, and if there's any processing that's done to them via, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'll let Emily deal with this first because she does simulations of clusters as well. So do you wanna speak to What's kind of the first step in generating a simulation? I mean, people, all of us can speak to this at some level, but for your cluster simulations, like what's the first thing? What do you, like, how do you parameterize that behavior? Because it sounds like, oh, simulation computers, right? But like, when it comes down to it, what, what's actually happening? Yeah, so the way that you sort of initialize a galaxy cluster merger simulation, at least in the idealized sense, where you're sort of forgetting about the rest of the universe, you're just studying the two galaxy clusters, it's sort of like painting a picture, right? So you know that there should be two clusters, they should have a certain amount of dark matter, they should have a certain amount of gas, um, and so you just kind of kind of paint those into a 3D space. So you're going to define what the clusters look like, um, and you can do this by using a number of models, um, which you could just as easily maybe draw by hand. So you're going to set those clusters in, and you're just going to start giving them some sort of velocity to trigger their collapse into one another. And then you can sort of input these models of how physics behaves. So all the things like mechanics, which you learn in high school, um, all the laws that we know about the universe and how physics works on local scales, and you can put that in the simulation. And then those two clusters that you initialized are just gonna run by those laws of physics um, and the outputs are gonna be really, really cool. Um, so simplistically, you're telling the simulation what you want it to look like at the beginning. You're giving it a particular set of rules to follow and you're just evolving it, letting the computer do its job. And then this, the second part of what you asked, like, how do we get the images out of that? Or how, how do those data then get put online for, for you to see? Um, a lot of that is done by, I mean, all of these simulations are different and all of the visualization tools that, that come out are different, but oftentimes what people will do, like for the movies that, that uh, Emily was showing, is try to have some sort of artificial telescope or artificial observer in the simulation kind of virtual domain, the virtual volume that you were simulating, look at it from the side in either x-rays or visible light rays or some sort of observational method to see how that would appear from the side or you know like i said simulations are different and the 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 thing that you're trying to study is different in many cases so that that, that varies a bit but for the most part you have some sort of you, you try and propagate the light as it would in the real universe through this virtual volume of space that's inside your computer and see what it looks like caitlin the other thing I wanted to add on about things we see on the internet, um, especially in the case of exoplanets or things that are kind of on smaller scales, 
Like if you see like, oh, look, there's this really pretty planet and this is like what we see. We don't see that. Um, it's an artist's interpretation. I think there's an important caveat to be said about that. Uh, specifically, because planets are so small, they kind of just look like bright little dots in the sky. So if you guys had a chance to look, I think at Saturn, Saturn, you can actually make out the rings, right, at this time of the year. And you can see, you know, that but that's really close. If you were to just keep moving Saturn further and further and further away, eventually you wouldn't be able to see the rings anymore. You'd just be able to see a little dot. And so I think that it's also important to say, like, especially with, like, popular science things that we see online you know they take a little bit of liberty and we have you know departments here that work on kind of advertising science and getting it out to people which is great but at the same time sometimes our data formats and like what we're actually looking at is not this beautiful picture like in the case of jdst or you know uh, the hubble space telescope they are actually looking at that field and they are actually taking a picture but for a lot of different fields we're kind of taking some liberties with that. Anything you wanted to add on about transients? Okay. Yeah. Does that roughly give you a, an idea? Going back to the discussion before that question about uh, expansion of the universe and clusters remaining gravitationally bound. So I've read about, uh, you know, theories about how the universe ultimately ends, you know, possibly collapsing back in on itself in a big crunch or just expanding forever and continuing at a continually faster, faster rate. And in that latter scenario, um, eventually getting to the point where in theory, if like we were still around to see it, which it's so far in the distant future that we certainly won't be, but that, you know, you wouldn't see anything at all in the sky because everything would have expanded to the point of being beyond being visible how does how does that square with what you're talking about about the clusters remaining gravitationally bound uh, although space is expanding I mean, we're just talking about a, a scale the, the the remaining gravitationally bound but on a just a huge scale that would preclude us from seeing you know like in the case of inside the milky way seeing you know the other galaxies in the local group yeah, so you're, you're essentially trying to understand how this operates and how it squares with us in the Milky Way and the idea that we aren't going to be able to see distant galaxies in the distant future because they'll have traveled too far from us. Is that? Well, yeah, I mean, just that it, 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 if in this scenario where, there, where, where nothing is, sorry. Yeah. in this d the very distant future scenario, trillions of years that where the everything is expanded away from us to the point where we we couldn't see anything from earth if we were here to see it which we won't be but no um is that consistent with these clusters still being gravitationally bound so in other words can they be so far away that you can't see them and yet still be gravitationally bound to one another that, that's what i'm trying to reconcile is like the fact that these would remain gravitationally bound despite the fact that the universe is expanding and yet be so far away that we couldn't see them from from our vantage point here. Do you guys, I mean, I can talk, but if you guys want to talk, Sam, do you want to talk? Okay. Uh, no, it's coming out as a coherent question. Um, as we understand it right now, due to this dark energy that is poorly understood, but based on its kind of current trajectory, it's accelerating the expansion. And so, yes, this is getting more and more spread out and it's actually accelerating. So it's kind of picking off structures. So those clusters of galaxies, which are gravitationally bound and the space between them, they're the largest structures, right? And eventually, potentially, the expansion could exceed their, their ability to kind of continue to collapse despite that expansion and the same could happen for the local group so that we're only we can only see the stars around us and people talk about the the possibility of this is the the big rip right the the expansion gets accelerated to such a degree that okay so pretty soon even gravitationally bound structures can't can't recollapse on the time scale at which the universe is expanding and so then maybe we no longer can see the stars in our own milky way galaxy despite the fact that it's gravitationally bound because the universe expands 
too fast a rate. And then people talk about going smaller and smaller scales until even the atoms that make up our bodies are the space between those atoms accelerates and our body can't compensate. And then we're just kind of disintegrated, right? Not a very happy ending to the universe, but it is potentially potentially one of the, the endpoints for, for what we've got here. And so people talk about, you know, one potential endpoint of the universe is that the universe will be kind of this unthinkably large structure, but very large spaces between the, the only left bound structures in them, which are black holes, which can't really be pulled apart per se, because the singularity is an infinitesimal point, and that they slowly are, due to Hawking radiation, although that's a very long time scale, are irradiating their mass in, in kind of this, this, this warm radiation that travels outward. And so, you know, one of the rather popular endpoints of our time in this universe is to have a bunch of almost infinitely separated black holes containing all the matter with you know this bath of of radiation that kind of separates them that's all at a, a warm warmish temperature it's not it's not a super pleasant view but you know what end of the universe is a super pleasant view um astrophysically speaking but does that make sense that that potentially due to this lambda, due to this gravi uh, this dark energy, that it's essentially eroding the gravitationally bound structures largest to smallest over time? Yeah, that's what I was getting at. So at a certain, at a certain point, yeah. the, the, the dark energy that's expanding the universe will overcome. So even these clusters, there is a certain point where they will they will not be gravitationally bound to each other if, if it just keeps getting faster and faster. Yeah. We don't know that it will continue in that that dark energy will continue in that capacity to accelerate as it is right now. But if it does, then that's, that's, that's kind of one way in which these things will erode. Good. It's a sad, sad thing to end on. We should take one more question instead of just talking about, there's a woman in the back. Thanks. Um, I just have a question on, I was watching one of the theories on multi-universes. Um, I guess just like a general explanation on what that is or like what that theory is. Who wants to talk about the multiverse, the Spider-Man multiverse? <laughs> These are maybe not popular feelings, but... Okay. <laughs> If you can't test it, it's not physics. It's not, <laughs> by definition, an alternate universe is something that we don't see inside our own universe and thus could never observe, by definition. So it's like, you know, I, I mean, it's very exciting to, to consider the possibility of different universes. I think this is particularly interesting, especially in the context of black holes where you have an event horizon. What's on the other side of the event horizon? And people, you know, you can sort of draw diagrams of, of black holes and you have another universe on the other side of the event horizon. I think it's important to recognize that by definition, you can't observe it. So it's it sort of falls outside the realm of science. Um, it's a lot like string theory in that respect, where so, you can't test it. So it doesn't matter. It so, doesn't exist. So, so I agree with you. I agree with you, Sam, that so, so as Sam angrily put, uh, <laughs> that science is all it's it's an empirical study, right? It's based on things that we have evidence for. And so when you start talking about uh, what's beyond what's inside of a black hole where we can't really observe directly what's inside of a black hole or what's beyond the uh, the edge the the edge of the observable universe where we can't actually observe that we don't really know and it starts it stops being science and it becomes more like philosophy um however with so the idea of this uh multiverse or something like that is that potentially you have many different universes all like our own that are kind of beyond our universe and somehow related to each other perhaps perhaps not but one way one way to push back a little bit uh the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics such that uh you know sometimes matter behaves like a particle and sometimes it behaves like a wave and the reason it behaves like a wave is because it's 
potentially interacting with many other many other wave fronts like the two slit experiment or something like this, but we don't see those in reality, but they may be present in some higher dimensional space. There's some possibility for potentially some evidence in the future. I'm not trying, it's very hand wavy, but we, we, we know that we don't know everything, right? And so there will be a time in the future where we will have a better understanding of things and it may allow us to warp some of the, what we right now view as hard and fast rules of the physical, physical laws and physical science, and potentially maybe we'll be able to do something with that. But right now, the multi, multiverse kind of idea is, is yeah, I, I would consider it more in the realm of philosophy as opposed to like hard science. It's fun to think about. It's fun to think about. And the one thing I can also add is looking on scales like our Earth or on other solar systems, I mean, there's also the possibility that there are other places in our own universe which could also act like a multiverse where, you know, very famously Star Trek says, you know, life, but not as we know it. And there are different interpretations of what we think life may or may not be able to be. But the only interpretation we have right now is something that we see here on Earth. And so, you know, looking around, even on the scale of our own universe, I think there's a lot to even discover that kind of could mimic something like a multiverse and could lead to so many more questions than, you know, answers that we really end up getting. If you have anything else to add, Emily. Add is these things are really, really fun to think about, regardless of whether or not they're testable, whether they qualify as science, they're certainly interesting. Um, yeah. Okay. That brings us to the end of the evening. Online audience, I feel like a jerk. We didn't get to any of your questions. Sorry, YouTube audience. I know there were a lot of good ones. Um, I know, but we had, we had constant questions from the in-person audience, and I didn't want to scorn our in-person audience to ask the YouTube. So, so great job, audience. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. And as I mentioned at the beginning, our next one of these is at the end of September. It will be uh, it will be on a project, a new project called Project Far Side that they're tr they're proposing to build a radio telescope on the far side of the moon to do some amazing science there. Really cool. Um, a postdoc in our department, Navedita, is going to give uh, Navedita Mahesh is going to give this presentation. So it should be super cool. And in two weeks time we'll have our next astronomy on tap that is going to be at the dog house in old town pasadena featuring two talks one about supermassive black holes warping and shaping the galaxies around them and the other about why stars form at all and what's going on in stars uh, both by postdocs here and at the carnegie observatories and don't forget if you are of of such a uh, such a huge fan of astronomy that you want to go to an awesome dark sky site. The Sequoia National Park Dark Sky Festival is in two weeks, two weeks from tomorrow. It is free. It's about five hour drive from here, but there will be telescopes, very dark skies. There will be lectures given by a number of people in this department and it should be great. So I encourage you to check that out. Look up Sequoia Dark Sky Festival online if you're interested. Thanks for listening. Thank you to uh, Emily, wonderful presentation, and thank you to all of our panelists. Have, hope you guys got a good view through the telescope, and we'll see you guys next month. Thank you. <laughs>